morning, everyone. Did you enjoy that extra hour last night? Oh, my goodness. That's great stuff. We're going to do it again next weekend. Okay? As it come, uh, when it comes to portrait painters, a uh, few can compete with Dimitri Vail. Uh, his uh, shading, his use of colors, his realism, it's so real, you wonder if it's uh, a, a, you know, a photograph. If you go into his gallery in Dallas, Texas, uh, you see all these movie stars and uh, sports stars. And uh, you just go down, you look at them, they're so real. At the end of the line, there's a, a little smaller portrait, and the person's sad looking and somber. You wonder, who's that? Turns out that's Dimitri Vale. It was done at a time when things weren't going so well for him, and uh, things were sad. And uh, you think, wow. Uh, He's hanging around with Hollywood stars and, you know, superstars in, in sports. Uh, you would think he'd be the most upbeat, happy guy in the world. Um, but it turns out he's like the rest of us, facing tough times. Um, Apostle Paul never used a paintbrush as far as we know. But his gallery of portraits is in the New Testament book of Romans. The first chapter is his first portrait. It's called Sinner, Desperate Sinner. Then his next portrait is Justified Sinner. The next chapter is in Romans. And then the next one is Victorious Christian. But then his last portrait is somber and sad, and you look at it, and the bottom of it, it says, wretched man. Well, this is the second in our series uh, called Christian Power 201. Open your Bible today to Romans chapter 7. If you'd like to use the Bibles under the seats, it's on page 1,131. Romans 7 is Paul's self-portrait. Near the end of the portrait, he exclaims, what a wretched man I am. Why, after escaping the tyranny of sin, does the next portrait depict an afflicted, miserable man? To find the answer, we must understand the difference or the relationship between the believer and the law. Whether you're a teenager, single, married, divorced, widowed, you have to understand this relationship. Paul shares four. First, Christians are freed from the law so they can live by the Spirit. Paul starts off, Do you not know, brothers and sisters, this is verse 1, chapter 7, I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority. The law would be like the Ten Commandments. And then the rest of the whole Old Testament, which is commentary on that. The law has authority over someone only as long as the person lives. He tells us that through our identification with Christ, through his death, we are set free from the law's dominion over us. Paul certifies this point by using the analogy of marriage. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law that binds her to him. So then if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she's called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. When one partner in a marriage dies, the other is free to remarry. At the wedding ceremony, he says, will you love, honor, and cherish as long as you both shall live? Uh, the covenant is as long as you both shall live. In the same way, as death terminates a marriage, in Christ's death, Christians are set free from slavery to sin. We're no longer slaves to sin, but we make ourselves slaves to Christ. But the motive, 
of our service is altered. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we've been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Why do Christians fo uh, follow Christ? Not because the law is our master and we have to, but because Christ is our husband and we want to. Uh, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? If we're freed from the law, does this mean the law is bad? No. The second thing we understand about the relationship between Christians and the law, is Christians recognize the good purpose of the law. Paul proceeds to defend the law and say why it's good. He gives two reasons. One, the law reveals our sin. Verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin is had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Paul says that the, the law, which is written on every human's heart, Romans 2.14, so we all have a sense, every human being in this world has a sense of the difference between right and wrong. But the written law, the Old Testament, makes it crystal clear what is right and what is wrong. Before the law was given, I might have thought I was doing fine. But the law makes us aware that we have sin in our lives. Not too many years ago, people would not know that they had cancer until it was too late. They would experience symptoms. They go in the doctor, and the doctor would give them bad news. Now, since the, uh, the invention of the MRI, we can take pictures deep into our body beneath the, the muscles and the ligaments, and, and the doctor can say, there's a tumor there, but we've caught it in time. We can take it out. Or by chemo or radiation, we can shrink it. I think you're, I think you're going to be fine. Now, a person that hears this news would be silly to blame their cancer on the MRI. If anything, they should be thankful for it, that it revealed it in time that they can be treated. The law is God's MRI. Paul says, in essence... I didn't know I was dying from the disease of sin until the law revealed my terminal illness. I was like a living dead man. The law demonstrated that I was living under a death sentence of sin. The law is God's MRI. Its purpose is to expose the disease of sin and death and to confront us with the diagnosis. The, de the disease is deadly, but it's completely curable. Does the law cause death? No, no more than an MRI causes cancer. The law reveals our sin like an MRI reveals cancer. Another good purpose of the law is the law exposes our sinfulness. But sin, verse 8, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. The law exposes our sinfulness. The law says don't covet. Due to my sin nature, it makes me want to covet all the more. Uh, one of the first high-rise hotels built in Galveston, Texas, was built right on the Gulf. It was right over the water, so the balcony rooms looking out over the water were over the water, and it made the hotel management think, you know, we better put up signs, absolutely no fishing. They thought, you know, the combination of, of high winds and heavy lead sinkers and, and the, the, the plate glass windows of the first floor restaurants would be a bad combination. So guess what happened? All kinds of people started fishing. People be having dinner and these lead weights would slam into the windows. Sometimes they would crack them. 
So the management realized their error, and so they removed all the signs. Problem solved. No one ever again fished. You tell us don't covet, and we want to covet. You say you can't do something. We want to do it all the more, right? The law exposes our sinfulness. The third relationship between the believer and the law is Christians admit that we are chronically addicted to sin. We know that the law is spiritual, verse 14, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Verse 18, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. His description of himself is so dark that we wonder if this is a description of his pre-conversion experience. But I'm confident that Paul is not talking about his pre-conversion experience, but his present experience as a Christian. Paul spoke in the past tense in Romans 7, 1 to 13, but in 7, 14 to 25, he speaks in the present tense, his present experience. Believing that Paul is talking about his present experience also allows us to take the 30 plus times he used the first person singular, I, me, my, myself, at their face value. As a general rule, the more obvious, straightforward way to interpret the Bible is the best. Believing that Paul is talking about his present experience also gives us the most accurate, realistic portrayal of what it's like to live as a Christian. I'd love to tell you that once the Apostle Paul gave his life to Christ, that he never again had a problem with sin, but it's not true. This passage is crucial to understanding Christianity. Once we accept Christ, God doesn't end our freedom. The presence of the Holy Spirit comes in, but He doesn't put an end to our struggle with sin and rob us of our freedom. We still must choose whether we'll obey the allure of the sinful nature or we'll obey Christ. The Holy Spirit does not eradicate our sin nature. The sin nature still lives within us. It longs uh, to... Uh, be satisfied. It loves to be rebellious. Becoming a Christian marks not the end of the battle with sin, but the beginning. Only when Christ enters a life do we recognize our sin and the depth of our sinfulness. Paul's statement, I know that nothing good lives in me, far from being a statement of a pre-conversion experience, is the statement of a growing Christian. Now, who but mature believers say, nothing good lives in me? We're, doing, we're, we're being renewed by Christ, but the sin nature is still very much alive. I have times when I feel like I'm a great Christian, feel like I'm a good pastor, and then I do or say something stupid, and I feel like a miserable failure. I identify with Paul. Verse 15, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. If this verse was the only evidence, you might think that Paul was a golfer. I used to golf quite a bit when I was in high school. Um, key, key words in that sentence are used to. I'm a terrible golfer now. But uh, our home course, we had uh, one hole, about, uh, the pin was about 250 yards and uh, right in front of the hole was a, a lake, about 200 yards. So, you know, you got to clear the lake. You got any chance. So I'm, so I'm saying, okay, I don't, I don't want to hit the lake. You know, I want to swing through relaxed and, and hit it strong. But that's exactly where I'd hit it, I'd land in the water. For I know, verse 18 that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. These are the words of a Christian who knows the will of God, wants to do it, yearns for it, but finds by themselves they cannot do it. We hate evil, but we find ourselves doing it anyway. This is the conflict all Christians face. Our old life was put to death. We're justified of our sin, but we struggle to obey Christ day by day. 
Why does this happen? Verse 21 supplies the answer. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. There's a civil war within me. What's the matter? Verse 17, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, verse 20, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. It's the sin that lives within me. I've taken on Christ's new nature. I'm being transformed into Christ's likeness, but I still have an old nature within me that dogs me every step of the way. I'm chronically addicted to sin. Most experts agree that cold turkey uh, withdrawal from heroin is one of the most uh, torturous experiences a, a, a person can go through. Uh, the insomnia, the diarrhea, the vomiting, bone <clears throat> and muscle pain. It's just torturous. And even though a person can, you know, it, it, it peaks about, about three days after the last heroin dose, but it, it goes on for about a week but even though people get through that and, and they can separate themselves from physical dependency to heroin, many return to using it. Why? Because the same urges that, that drove them to escape into heroin are still living within them. That craving. And they find that they can't win the battle alone. Um, anyone who has experienced physical uh, dependence on anything will affirm that the craving is never far away. Now, people that have smoked uh, and, and have, have beat the habit will say even years later that craving is still there and they long for a cigarette after a good meal. So that dependence, that addiction never goes away. The person is always an addict it's a lifeline endeavor. Uh, it's not just a, a battle. So, so treating addiction is not just beating it physically. It's also, re, re, uh, it takes treating the mind. The, the addict is never really cured. The addiction will always be part of their lives. However, an addict can remain in recovery forever. Sam told me 30 years just celebrate 30 years sobriety. To deal with the addiction to sin, some people want to create a super Christian to teach spiritual secrets so that we can somehow rise above the rest of people. I've read so many books over the years about the victorious Christian life. There are dozens of books on the marketplace uh, that tell you all kinds of spiritual secrets so you can live in never-ending Christian victory. I think that's why Paul puts this chapter in Romans, to show that he's not a super-Christian. He doesn't have some spiritual potion that catapults him above the rest of the human race. Your family breaks down, his family breaks down. You get sick, he gets sick. You face temptation, he faces temptation. The struggle with our sin nature will never end. That nature that lusted before you met Christ will lust after you meet Christ. That nature that stole before you came to know Christ will steal after you become a Christian. That nature that gossiped about other people before you came to Christ will gossip about people after you come to Christ. It claws, it clamors for disobedience. It says, shh, Paul, don't tell them you struggle with sin. You're an apostle. Ron, don't tell them you battle with sin. You're a pastor. But it's the truth. Your, not, your life will never be fully victorious. If you can become perfected beyond the struggle with sin... You become progressively less and less in need of the grace of God. Under that sort of thinking, sanctification would be the process of becoming so good 
So perfect that you have less need for the forgiving love of God. So don't be shocked when you fail. Leave room for failures. Lighten up on yourself. We all struggle with sin. But when you fall, admit it and get on going again. And how about giving people around you a little slack? They're battling with the sin nature just like you are. Christians can be some of the most judgmental people in the world. Pray for people more and criticize them less. Recognize they're battling with a sin nature just like you are. They need your forgiveness, not your condemnation. Finally, Christians turn to God's divine power through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Paul's beside himself. He says, I fail over and over again. Then he answers, thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the power source we must get a grip on. Paul comes to, to the end of himself and cries out to Christ. I think that's why God allows the sin nature to continue in us. He wants us to come to the end of ourselves and learn to depend on him. To this point, not a word has been whispered about the Holy Spirit. This is where Paul's going next in Romans chapter 8. He's going to give us the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. He's the answer to our struggle with sin. Don't you dare miss next week as we look at the, the power of the Holy Spirit. But before you're ready for the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you must come to an end to yourself and admit that you can't do it. We're not saved by grace and then sanctified by our own effort. The point of Paul's portrait in Romans 7 is to demonstrate that humanity can no more purify itself after salvation than before. Only God can purify a person. So what's our duty as followers of Christ living in grace? Our primary purpose is to know Christ with ever-deepening deepening intimacy. So if you read the Bible, you know, this survey, we're trying to see how many of you do that. If, if you use our journal, we want to know, you know, who's using it. If you pray, the purpose is not to somehow gain points with God. The purpose is to experience Christ on a more intimate level. If we worship, we partake of Holy Communion, we go attend a community group, the purpose is to experience Christ more intimately. If we feed the poor, help the hurting, share our story with needy people, let our walking in Christ's footsteps help us experience more deeply His character. The spiritual disciplines are not for our own holiness. They're a means of knowing Christ. As we come to know Him more intimately, then the Holy Spirit can transform us, will transform us into the image of Christ. The Holy Spirit will do what only He can do. When eagles toss their eaglets out of the nest, the eaglets don't fly. They fall. They're not trying to fly. They're trying to not die. They flap their hands and their wings, but they continue to fall. And then they discover that when I flap my wings, I actually go up. They discover their wings and they soar. If you get a grip on the power of the Holy Spirit, you will soar. With the how power of the Holy Spirit, you can soar. I love Apostle Peter's words in 2 Peter 1, uh, verses 3 and 4. His divine power has given us all that we need for life and godliness, according to our knowledge of Him, who has called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us very great and precious promises so that we may participate in the divine nature 
and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. To live as Christians, we have to get a grip on the power source, the Holy Spirit. God's divine power living inside us is the only way we can win in the struggle with sin. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for this chapter in Romans 7. It's kind of surprising. After Paul has described human sin and Christ's grace through his death on the cross and how we can have victorious new life, put a death to the old nature. Then we have this chapter 7. He says, what a wretched man I am. We say, what's going on? He wants us to understand that the sin nature will always stay with us. It'll always be a battle. And we'll, we're going to feel like wretched people many times. So thank you that you help us understand that we don't rise above it. We never get perfect this side of heaven and never experience full victory. It's always going to be a battle. But thanks to Jesus Christ, our Lord, who delivers us, there's more power in your Holy Spirit than there is in our sin nature. And if we depend on you, we can experience new life and freedom from sin. We don't have to fail every time. So thank you for that. I want you to pray right now. Tell God you want to experience the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You feel like a wretched, why don't you confess that to him? You feel like a wretched person so much of the time. Ask him to help you depend on his power source. Get a grip on that. You pray right now. Thank you, Lord God, for the Apostle Paul's self-portrait. It makes him more real. It makes us more understand what it is we're shooting for as followers of Christ. Not perfection. We'll never get there. We're not trying to show other people how holy we are. We're not. We struggle with sin just like they do. But we can experience more with the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us depend on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.